thank you and welcome to the talk to expert program i am dr shalya sharma and today we have with us mr jitin ma before we go forward i would like to discuss a little bit about ice stem portal indian science technology and engineering facilities map ice stem is a national program of government of india for shaping the r and d infrastructure and supports academia and industry to achieve the goal at nirbhar bharat it holds the database of functioning r and d equipment and facilities from government or private funding with options to researchers to check the availability and operational status of geographically dispersed facilities and reserve the most suitable one online in paper use through the portal digital catalog on ice stem portal is available with 700 plus technology and technology products as mandated by the empowered technology group to help academia and industry to decide the thrust areas and use the available indigenous technologies products to manufacture the required infrastructure for the society ice stem is <coughs> striving to create the pool of skilled manpower and the job opportunities for them in scientific establishment so today we have with us my my friend uh, mr jithin ma he is uh, working in nnfc functional thin film laboratory as a senior facility technologist at center for nano science and engineering science at isc bangalore jithin holds bachelor's and master's degree in physics at the moment he is pursuing his phd degree under the external registration scheme in the department of physics national institute of technology karnataka surat kal his research interest include thin film pvd shape memory alloys and mems optical coatings by iron beam deposition techniques for rlgs and vacuum instruments now i am handing over the session to jitin sadesh thank you yeah so i am just making a presenter yeah you try you can share your slides yes sure thank you Good afternoon. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the uh, portal for uh, giving me opportunity to present this uh, topic. I think I'll switch off my video because here uh, not on the face. So yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So I hope almost like this is the audience. All the numbers nearly some ten or fifteen there. So it is okay. okay. We can start this. Right. Yes, you can start the thing. Yeah, Just yeah. share your slides because right now I cannot see your slides. Yeah, correct. I know. Okay. So I will be talking about vacuum technology. Just hide this. Yeah, this bar. Just hide. There is an option near the stop sharing. Hide. Yeah. Yeah. It's fine. Yeah. Go ahead now. Yeah. So today I'll be discussing more about uh, vacuum technology and uh, how to create a vacuum, measurement of vacuum, then diagnose of vacuum, and uh, some some techniques of, uh, to find the leaks in the vacuum. All those things we'll be talking. So we'll be starting with vacuum. And what is vacuum? The levels of vacuum, gas behavior, and sources of gas uh, releases to the chamber. Then production of vacuum, measurement of vacuum, good vacuum practices, all those things. As for am I audible? Uh, sorry, am I audible? Uh, yeah. you, you, can you be a little louder? Because yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll do that. I'll do that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I think it is fine now. Uh, my, yeah, my question, it is. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So first of all, uh, why vacuum? So vacuum is like applicable nowadays everywhere. So we must be seen uh, like from our childhood research. This kind of incandescent uh, bulb where we use a vacuum for the ignition. Uh, consider that there is no vacuum here and if you just power this filament, what happens within no time this filament I mean, burns away. So, because of the oxidation. So, certain applications we need to reduce the pressure. I mean, we need to create vacuum uh, for the processing. So, there are, there are n number of applications for vacuum. There are few of them are mentioned here, like vacuum deposition, like CBD, PVD techniques, then microfabrication, 
then semiconductor optical coatings and optical industries and they are used back home. Then material character technology is important again, like electron microscopes, XPS, SIMS, RBS, they are all using very uh, high vacuum system, I mean ultra high vacuum systems. Then e-beam welding, cold welding, vacuum tubes, vacuum packing. So we are enrolled the vacuum, I mean, is very much needed. Uh, what is vacuum first? Like there is a lot of, uh, I mean, uh, uh, definitions like in, it is an environment of reduced pressure uh, or we can say a state of a space which is devoid of all matter. Uh, but if you see this ideal gas where U is equal to NRT and we substitute all the values uh, to multiply with our product number, you will get a value like 2.46 into power 25. So how to quantify vacuum? So if you see, if you have a vacuum chamber of uh, in, uh, one meter cube in space, there if the number of gas molecules are less than 2.5 into power 25, it is that area is known as that space is known as uh, it is under vacuum. Okay, so that is a quantification uh, of vacuum. And uh, when we talk about vacuum, it is again like reducing the pressure. So there are a lot of uh, units for pressure, like tau, uh, millimeter of mercury, then uh, microns, millimeter, psi, pascal, then bar. Uh, throughout this presentation, I will be talking in terms of millibar. And few of the slides, I mean, uh, images in the shape from internet that we'll be talking in terms of uh, milli I mean, tall. Okay. So, first of all, what is the uh, atmospheric pressure? It is nothing but one bar. Actually, uh, accurately, we can say like uh, 1013.25 millibar. So, that is our atmospheric pressure. Okay. So, what are the gases present in the atmospheric pressure? Nothing but nitrogen is dominating 78 percentage, then oxygen, then argon, carbon dioxide. So these are the dominating gases in the atmospheric pressure. And if you see the, from the surface of, I mean, uh, uh, surface of Earth, we go upward direction. First, initial 200 kilometers will be mainly, uh, mainly air molecules. And beyond that, it will be mainly nitrogen and oxygen because they are the dominating gases here. But if you still go up, the lightweight gas molecules will be dominating, like, like hydrogen, helium, all those things. Okay. So when we go to the, I mean, when, uh, when altitude goes high, then pressure decreases. Okay? So why again the vacuum is needed? So, like you can see, electron beam evaporation, or thermal and sputtering, or even I mean, heat deposition techniques, or even a CM or a, what you can say, TEM control. There we have to move the particles over a large distance without having much collision. I mean, as you can say, in straight line. So there we need to reduce the, uh, I mean, pressure. I mean, reduce the gas molecules. So there and all, the vacuum is very much needed. And next comes benefit of vacuum. So it is provides a contamination free and uh, clean surface. So that is the benefit of vacuum. And mainly we can talk about to provide a clean environment. And uh, the clean surface for the I mean the process of materials, addition, I mean again addition is important. If there is no uh, I mean there is uh, gas molecules are more means the addition will be less in the coating center, so it can peel off. So that is important emission studies like in sims or in rbs then material testing for space application but also we use mainly is vacuum technology vacuum technology. so how uh, I mean, we are creating vacuum the pressure equations tells us p is equal to 1 by 3 into n and v square so if you see this uh, container you can see gas molecules are uh, like highlighted here they are having uh, zigzag direction motion they collide on the glass i mean on the chamber wall and they also collide each other. Uh, the collisions are elastic and for negligible duration. Uh, but one thing we have to see like the velocity of air molecules in uh, room temperature is nearly 1600 km per hour. Okay. So the pressure equation tells us we can change only the number or mass. So the number or velocity, mass we cannot change. Okay. So this uh, that is the main principle behind the evacuation. So we reduce the number of gas molecules, means we are creating the vacuum. So that is the easy method. So again, like molecular density and mean frequency. You see here, like there, is, there are two uh, chambers. Here you can see one chamber is at 100 psi, another one is 50 psi. Here the gas molecules are less, so there is chance of less collision. Here there are chance of more collision. So if you see like that, the mean frequency is nothing but the shortest distance traveled by molecules between two successive collisions. So this is like low pressure results in pure molecule. Uh, collisions and uh, that is useful for us for the material testing and deposition purpose. Okay. 
again the mean free path is important like you can see atmospheric pressure it is the mean free path is nearly few nanometer so you can say approximately 68 nanometer over uh, i mean uh, coming down to level some i mean we can say temperature minus 3 level or to minus 3 to minus 9 level and all you can see it is increasing tens of meter to 1 kilometer that is the these are the approximate values the very high vacuum ultra high vacuum and all you can see it is in uh, kilometer range okay so this is how uh, this is what we talk in terms of mean free path. Mean free path is very much important in case of uh, uh, materials deposition and characterization okay. So the gas flow. So before this, I need to talk to you I mean, regarding this one. So I'll consider that these these two chambers are two I mean, theaters, and one is completely filled with people, like it is house full, and it is one is having very less. If there is emergency. The people are evacuated from the uh, theater. They have enough number of patients between them. There will be standard, there will be have. But if you see here, they can easily move out from the, uh, the, I mean, the new, new theater hall. Okay. So similarly, turbulent flow, you can see this is a chaotic movement from atmospheric pressure to one millibar uh, pressure. But in case of this, I mean, uh, viscous flow, it is nearly one millibar to one, uh, 10 power minus three millibar. You can see here. Okay. And the molecular flow, which is again divided into volumetric flow and mass flow, it is nothing but minus 3 to lower level. So this volumetric flow, S, is known as the pumping speed. The volume of the gas motion across the across the reference point is nothing but liter per second. It is nothing but pumping speed. But mass flow, the amount of gas motion across the reference point is known as throughput. It is millibar liter per second. Okay. So these are the different gas flow regimes uh, when we. Uh, evacuate a vacuum chamber from atmosphere to uh, lower pressures. Okay. Am I audible? Hello? Yes. yes. Um, okay. Did you are audible? Yeah, perfect. Right. So, always when we talk about this, uh, I mean, uh, vacuum and evacuation, pressure reducing, a very good lot of confusion to people. Some people, they don't have the background of having I mean, uh, physics or uh, I mean, engineering, so they always have some confusion. So to avoid that, it is always better to compare the vacuum system with simple electric circuit. So you see one side electric analog and another side is vacuum analog. Uh, in electric analog, nothing but electric batteries that are powering the current flow. In this case, vacuum pump, here current flows, here are gas flows, I mean gas molecules flow. There will be a potential difference for the current to flow, there will be a pressure difference for the gas to flow here. Okay? Then there will be a resistance by the wire in the battery circuit. Here again, the resistance will be there in the pumping, uh, I mean pumping line. But always we will talk in terms of conduct, nothing but one by R. Okay, conductance over conductance of pipeline. So this is the conductance we talk about in the uh, vacuum system. But we will come to that later in the next slides. Okay? So this is just for comparison of electric analog and vacuum analog, just for easy understanding. So again, throughput it is nothing but the multiplication of uh, I mean pumping speed into pressure. So the volume is uh, millibar liter per second. So you can see here chamber and the pump. In between there will be a bellow or a vacuum port for connecting. So here the pump pressure will be P1 and this is P2. So pumping speed S1, S2. So if you see the resistance, it is nothing but P1 minus P2 divided by throughput. Inverse of that you can see 1 by R, nothing but Q by P1 minus P2 is E, is called conductance. In vacuum system, the term conductance is generally used than the resistance. Okay. To reduce the conduct, I mean, to increase the conductance, it is better to have a vacuum system in all the I mean, vacuum system and pump in always at the straight line. Some people they connect the vacuum system with elbows or loosens, there the conductance will get reduced. So it is always to have a good conductance for proper evaporation of the chamber. So this is a basic schematic of a uh, typical vacuum system. You can see the vacuum chamber here, and this is a high vacuum isolation valve. Then diffusion pump is given here. It can be diffusion or cryo or even turbo also. Then a rotary pump. There are butterfly valves. Then uh, gauges to measure the uh, pressure. So this is the uh, uh, important components of a vacuum system. Uh, generally, they have uh, they are used for various applications. Okay. So the next uh, thing is that sources of gas release. Before that, uh, we wanted to see here like. The uh, atmosphere pressure is 1013.25 millibar. I was telling in the first slides. And when we 
go to lower low vacuum it is in terms of uh, atmosphere pressure to 10 power minus 2 millibar ranges high vacuum is 10 power minus 6 to minus nine, minus 3 to minus 9 millibar ultra high vacuum means minus 9 to minus 12 outer space is nothing but 10 power minus 6 to minus uh, 17 level if there is something called perfect vacuum it can read zero in our gauges but our gauges never show zero that is because of these terms absorption diffusion permeation and dynamic just balance. so these are the important topics important things uh, of a vacuum system they are the sources of just release to the vacuum system so this cannot be stopped and that is why we are not getting a value like zero even if you run the system one year or ten year whatever it is we will not see the perfect pattern okay so what is absorption so these things we can see more clear i mean in detail in the next coming slides absorption diffusion permeation and leak so these are the things which uh, decide the vacuum, vacuum a ultra high, a high vacuum or ultra high vacuum in a vacuum system what is absorption it is the release of gas molecules stick on the vacuum chamber walls like oxygen nitrogen what moisture all those things will be stick on the vacuum chamber interior it can release to the vacuum chamber which can increase the pressure for some time which will be it is called as outgassing okay so the terminology is called as outgassing so this is absorption in terms of diffusion there can be gas molecules diffused into the vacuum chamber uh, walls through micro I mean, holes and all but they also can release to the vacuum chamber i mean to the vacuum chamber during the evacuation so again there can be an increase of uh, pressure that is called diffusion the next time is permeation from outside from atmosphere the gas molecules penetrate the joints or even micro holes micro leaks and all and can go inside so there the gases like carbon helium neon this cannot be stopped at all so this will be always there in the vacuum system all vacuum systems so this will contribute again uh, to decide the high vacuum levels okay so when you club all these things adsorption diffusion permeation and leak this leak can be mechanical leak okay real or virtual so this decides high vacuum over a period of time adsorption and diffusion becomes zero so it is nothing but permeation and leak that decides the high vacuum in a vacuum system. The virtual leak is nothing but absorption, diffusion, permeation. This we cannot uh, I mean, completely uh, stop. So it is called virtual leak. Real leak is leak in the mechanical sealing ports. I mean, we are seeing in this image here, right? So in the mechanical components, if there is a leak, that is called as a real leak. Okay. So this is a pictorial representation, diffusion, uh, then permeation, then outgassing, virtual leak, real leak, gas streaming from the wet pump. So this all contributes to uh, I mean, the high vacuum or ultra high vacuum in a vacuum chamber. Okay. So now we will go to the production of uh, vacuum. So how to create vacuum? So when we see this like uh, vacuum pumps, there are in, in a laboratory you can see a lot of vacuum pumps uh, like concrete uh, uh, pump, wood pump, dry pumps, and cryo diffusion, turbo. There are a lot of pumps. And we have to choose these pumps wisely to for specific applications. Uh, so here we uh, we are just talking. I'm mean, just talking about few of the pumps which we use regularly in the research labs. So one is positive displacement pump, nothing but rotary pump. Then momentum transfer pump, which is nothing but uh, diffusion pump and turbo monitor pump. Then entrapment type pump, cryo pump, sorption pump, and even ion pumps and all these come in this category. So we'll go to the classification for the vacuum pumps here then just uh, this is nothing but momentum transfer pump uh, this is nothing but again called as positive displacement pump rotary pump dry pump roots pump that will come in this category then momentum transfer pump here nothing but uh, diffusion pump and travel molecular pump then entrapment vacuum pumps sorption pump titanium sublimation pump i mean deterrent pump and evaporation ion pumps petroleum pump cryo pump so these things falls into the category of entrapment type pump so first we'll see the uh, positive displacement pump, nothing but the rotary vane. So you can see in this uh, video. So the air is uh, admitting to the uh, pump. It is called injection of air. Then isolation. It is isolated here. Then beginning of compression. It is compressing. You can see this red color. Then exhaust. So this is a typical uh, rotary vane pump, I mean oil pump. So this entire thing will be cut in the oil. Okay. So induction, isolation, 
compression exhaust. So this is the four stages in the rotary vacuum tank. Okay. The gas is displayed by varying the volume of the chamber. That is the volume of this. This is the volume view at regular interval of uh, at regular intervals, and this directed to the administration. Okay. So this is like uh, there are. Uh, how to choose the pump? You have to see the chamber volume, which you want to evacuate, and the vacuum requirement, the vacuum requirement of for the high vacuum pump, which is thermal pump, which needs, it needs a proper vacuum. So you have to choose the rotary pump accordingly. And four line vacuum pressure, that also I okay. And it's always better to choose the pump by seeing, I mean, uh, the noise levels and the air cooled and water vapor, like uh, I mean, low, oil, low oil charge, all those things, but go and high in that. So the working is like from atmospheric pressure to temperature minus two minus three level is okay. That much is the effectiveness of this pump. Okay. So ideally in the research laboratory they use rotary pump for the uh, backing purposes and even also some desiccation purposes. Uh, I mean mainly for low vacuum pressure. So then we go to the rotor pump. Here it's like that there is no oil. It's a dry pump. Uh, this rotors spin at a speed of uh, nearly. Or RPM of 2500 to 3500, and the synchronized rotor, like so this are there. And it is a high throughput, low compression pump, and you can achieve 10 to minus 4 with this pump maximum. So you can see here, this is the uh, rotors. Okay. Uh, so again, this is choosing, uh, you can see the vacuum requirement, power line vacuum, and chamber volume. And just look at the choose two pumps and the counting series uh, to increase the pump experiment. Again, here the uh, efficiency is starting from 10 power minus 2 to 10 power minus 1 minus 2 level. That's all. So it's also useful up to 10 power minus 2. But if you have two pumps in series, you can increase the uh, pumping speed to 10 power minus 4 also. Uh, then comes the widely used uh, turbo pump. So here you can see this is the. I think I will show the video faster because this is a lengthy video. So here this pump work on the principle of gas molecules uh, uh, giving the momentum to a particular direction. We uh, repeat the collision with rapidly moving solid surface, nothing but this gas, I mean this uh, uh, blades. So I can just show you the video to be in a uh, platform because it is a lengthy video. So this is the inlet of air molecules and it is going out from the exhaust. The, the rotary pump will be connected to this exhaust here as a backing pump to remove the gas molecules uh, coming to the rear side of the turbo pump. Okay. So this is the way how the turbo pump works. So these are the rotors and the uh, uh, I mean, stator, so which I can show you in the next uh, slide, SPPD, uh, sorry, next video. So, this is like, uh, sorry. So, this is how the uh, turbo pump assembly is being done. So, you can see these are the uh, rotors and this is the stator which uh, is assembly. So, after each stage arrived, uh, arrived installing, you have to Keep it rotating and seeing whether it is blocking somewhere or not. So, this is how the turbo pump assembly is carried out. So, now we will go back to the presentation. So this is the uh, construction of uh, turbo pump which you already seen, seen in the video. Uh, so, this is the gas molecules coming and the colliding on the surface of this uh, uh, blades and they're getting a momentum to enter the direction. So it goes on to the next uh, uh, starter, the next starter like that, it goes to the bottom of the pump, I mean, the rear side of the pump. This pump is very clean and mechanical compression pump, it has 9000 to 90,000 RPM in uh, water speed sensor and it requires always a, a mechanical four line pump for backing and it is hydrocarbon free uh, pump 
compared to the, the diffusion pump. And the positive thing is that uh, another important thing is that it can be mounted in any orientation. Okay? So that is again. So now, uh, uh, this next one is the potential problems which we see. Uh, there can be a slight imbalance in this pump when without, uh, when it is not used carefully. So that can lead to some kind of bearing uh, issue. Kind of. So just to be carefully seen. Then sudden blast of atmosphere pressure can bend the blades when it can damage also. So that also has to be carefully seen here. Then uh, too high pressure can cause the, uh, the lift or drag. This is again an important thing. Uh, then mechanical for uh, for line pump is must that is uh, cannot be avoided. So these are the potential problems or like uh, difficulties which we face with the turbo uh, pump. And the pumping uh, efficient I mean pumping uh, efficiency starts from the power minus one minus two level to thirty up to number minus uh, six minus seven level. Zero. So it is from minus three it suddenly starts. It's a high coming speed. Okay? So it's better to start the turbo pump at number minus two millibar per level. Then comes diffusion pump. So here it is like uh, again uh, the gas molecules are given in a particular direction. So you can see this is the uh, pump construction. There are oils oil here and here is the heater. When the heater heats the oil, the oil vapors goes to the uh, flow direction and that comes out through this kind of jets at supersonic speed. And they drive the gas molecules in the chamber to the bottom side and it comes to the uh, exhaust side. This exhaust is connected to the uh, rotor tank. So we can see a video about this also. You can see how we understand it. So you can see this is the heater here, heater part. The heater is getting heated up. And sitting on the heater, the gas molecule, I mean the oil vapor goes the upward direction. And they come out through this kind of jets uh, at the personal velocities. And they pull the gas molecules to the bottom. You can see it is going. So the gas molecules you can see here, it is coming down and that goes out and here we need to connect our uh, rotary pump for the uh, battery okay. so that is how uh, the pressure pump is working and now we will go to the side this is the pump construction and again like uh, to increase the high efficiency of uh, diffusion pump we need to have large Admittance area to capture more air molecules, but this can cause uh, the bad diffusion of oil, which can uh, lead to hydrocarbon contamination in the process chamber. So, it is a very like important thing in the diffusion pump. We have to use some liquid nitrogen trap or uh, chavron baffles for uh, stopping this uh, hydrocarbon entry to this uh, process chamber. Okay? And it's again like 300 to 2000 liter per second pumping speeds available, and uh, cold cap is uh, necessary to reduce the. Uh, oil vapors entering backstream into the chamber and liquid nitrogen filled cryotraps are always used with the diffusion pumps. Okay. So, the oils which is used is like uh, there are different levels of oils, lipton oil, can oil, oil, the DC705, DC705, mainly we use DC705 in the laboratories. And that oil is again important that it should have properties like high molecular weight to have larger momentum and it should have low vapor pressure. To vaporize easily, and it should be chemically inert when we deal with any kind of, uh, uh, you know, I mean, reactive gases. Uh, then it's not crack due to prolonged heating. So this is very important uh, things we to consider when we are taking the oil. Okay? And the pumping speed is again like uh, against uh, ground curve is ten to minus three effective. In number minus one starts, but under minus three to minus nine and all maximum it can reach. Okay. Again, there will be a uh, when you heat this uh, heater at the bottom, there should be a cooling coil also on the surface of this pump. I think I, I missed that portion here. Yeah, these are the uh, cooling uh, water, water cooling lines uh, around the pump. So, this cooling, if it is uh, excess in cooling, 
what happened is the oil heat will be decreased, so it will reduce the performance of the pump. It will affect the performance of the pump. The next is a thermal uh, cutoff uh, is necessary if there is water flow is stopped for cooling. So when the heat increases, it should cut off at any degree. It is again important. So then we go to the next sort of uh, uh, pump like an entrapment pumps. Here the mode of uh, operation is in different places like sorption, uh, desorption, I mean uh, desorption and regeneration. In sorption phase, the pump is used to create the vacuum. Uh, desorption uh, uh, phase is nothing but to warm the pump to the room temperature. The gas is escape through the pressure relief valve. Regeneration is to heat the pump over to 300 degree to dry off all the water vapor that does not dissolve at room temperature. Okay, so these are the three important uh, things in the sorption pumps. So first one we are going to discuss is sorption pump. So here the sorption pump is nothing but a pump like this. You can see here. This pump is uh, uh, immersed to the liquid nitrogen. You can see at the I mean one minus one ninety six degrees Celsius and nearly one to seven Kelvin, and almost two to three gallons of liquid nitrogen is necessary to fill in this uh, uh, vessel and to immerse this pump in that. And this pump can, compared to other pumps, it, this, this does not need any electricity or any power for just starting this pump. It is all automatically work with cooling. Effect. And this pump does not have any kind of uh, uh, what you can say cooling parts also. Okay, so when we keep it, this in uh, liquid nitrogen, the molecular CU you can see here molecular CU or this in the reactor, and they trap the air molecules, uh, just, I mean gas molecules in this, and like that we can reduce the uh, pressure. Okay, so this portion will be connect connecting to the pump. Again, the pumping efficiency starts from uh, from where you can say. Uh, 10 power minus 1, 10 power minus 3, minus 6, depends upon the chamber volume. Okay. okay, almost all gases that contains that uh, nearly uh, what you can say, 30 Kelvin, Kelvin or uh, 20 Kelvin. Some of the gas molecules like helium, hydrogen, helium, these are the lightweight gas molecules, which is very difficult to condense. So, there has to be a trapped in the pores, I mean, uh, uh, as shown in the image. So this is how a uh, sorption pump works. So it is gas molecules comes and gas molecules come on the I mean that contents down the surface. And it is completely happening by chaos condensation and chaos sorption as we discussed. Here. So there is no moving parts, no electricity connection, no vibration. There is no contamination, this fluid surface, there is only liquid nitrogen deposition. This is made up of aluminium for high rate heat transfer. And there will be a always fail safe pressure relief valve to reduce the pressure that the gas molecules trapped inside the pump after the vacuum. Then comes cryo pump. Cryo pump is nothing but uh, used uh, uses a cold temperature to condense the gas molecules uh, to a solid uh, uh, actual stage here. So you can see a liquid helium, but if you see a uh, So it's like they, they use uh, closed helium circuit for the uh, pump to contains the gas, I mean, uh, to reduce the pressure from it, uh, to reduce the temperature from it, uh, room temperature to uh, 15 Kelvin. And some gases like I said, told the previous space, neon, hydrogen, helium, or can be absorbed. So they start producing. Uh, they get trapped by charcoal and lead or CO light in the bio arrays. Okay. Again, the operator is the chamber minus two to minus nine. Also, we can say depends upon the chamber volume and coming capacity. So this is how a cryo pump works. The gas molecules get condensed on the uh, cold surfaces. So it is a, using a closed loop helium compressor. I like in the case of AC uh, refrigerator, AC compressor. Typically, it has 100 to 5,000 5, liter per second pumping speed and completely oil heat can, can operate any, any radiation away. It, it is a high, uh, like a very clean vacuum with high pumping speed. And next thing is that it is very useful in the uh, to pump the water vapor and moisture and when we deal with any serious process. Okay. The next thing is that uh, this is the 
come under the cryo, come how it is going to cryo happens eventually. So the complete speed of different gases it is showing. So this is the helium uh, compressor. The compressed helium uh, is like sent to the cold head area where it is allowed to adiabatically expand and it come back to the close circuit to the uh, compressor again. Then again with the compress and they go back to the cold head again like that. So it's a closed cycle. Uh, that results in adiabatic expansion nothing but it results in the lowering of temperature from uh, room temperature to nearly 15 Kelvin or 10 Kelvin you can reach based on the size of the tank. Okay. So here again the potential problems are nothing but uh, we need to uh, regenerate the cryo pump after every 70,500 hours which is nothing but uh, nearly two years. Then uh, the next one is like it it has to how how to do this regeneration it has to allow to uh, heat up to the um, uh, room temperature i mean from uh, 15 degree it has to come to the room temperature then we can again uh, heat with, uh, with some other tapes and uh, heat tapes and at uh, 20 degrees and same time we have to evacuate the pump also uh, the next thing is that must be started below uh, 10 power minus 2 or uh, better to use 5 to minus 2 or below using a roughing pump but if it is not started like that, if your pressure is higher in the cryo pump, the uh, heat dissipates and you can see some kind of uh, chillness or some kind of ice formation in the cryo pump. This is again not good in the cryo uh, pump. Okay. So only thing is that the regeneration takes the pump off for several hours. That's all. That is the drawback again you can see. So again like you can see it is very effective towards pumping water or air or something like that. Uh, and we go to the entrap type pump here the there are two different types one is chemical cleanup pump and evap and electrical cleanup pump in chemical cleanup pump it is nothing but sublimation pump titanium sublimation pump electrical cleanup pump is called evaporation pump and suction pump so they, they use uh, the principle of gathering the materials the materials like titanium tantalum alloy of the uh, titanium mold etc they use as battery materials as they have strong admitted towards water vapor. So water vapor and also other gases like nitrogen oxygen and so these materials are used for the battery purposes in the uh, chemical cleanup pump or battery cleanup pump. So chemical cleanup pump is nothing but you can see the titanium sublimation pump they, they are using a titanium wire and there will be a sump in the bottom. So this titanium uh, atoms so titanium atoms will and they react with the gas molecules present here, like oxygen from TiOx to titanium and nitrogen from TiNx and uh, uh, Ti hydrogen, hydrogen TiX with the uh, water vapor from TiOx and hydrogen. So, like that, it reduces the uh, gas molecules. I mean, uh, in, the, in the sealed container, I can check. So, this is useful to, with, I mean, uh, like uh, high, very ultra high vacuum systems like Fe and where the electron gun column will be in 10 power minus 9 or minus 11 for production. And mainly this tungsten wire will be, uh, the titanium wire will be having molybdenum pressure as an alloy to avoid filament breaking easily. Okay. So that is what uh, titanium sublimation pump. Next comes ion pumps like uh, spectra ion pump and electrical I and mean, low pressure pump. Spectra ion pump is nothing but. Uh, the electrodes like cathode and anode, uh, sorry, uh, cathode and anode. Uh, hello, hello, yeah, cathode and anode. So, here uh, the cathode is made up of better materials like titanium, titanium, molybdenum, alloy, or tantalum. So, uh, there will be a high magnetic field, uh, combined magnetic field and electric field. So, the gas I and mean, the gas molecule get ionized, the gas molecule get ionized, and they react with these better materials and they get buried on the surface of the uh, cathode. And like that, it creates vapor from 10 power minus 3 to minus 3, minus 5, this is for instance, minus 5 actually, and up to minus 10. Right? So the pumping speed is again 10 to power 4 meter per second. Right? Okay. The magnetic field is applied to increase the path of the electrons to have more probability of ionizing the air molecules. Nothing but combined magnetic field, uh, lower of force, uh, e into e plus e plus. So again, next thing is evaporation ion pump. Here, there will be a tungsten filament. And this tungsten filament will be protected by a grid that will avoid coating by titanium. This titanium uh, wire will be completely I mean, uh, supplied by a titanium wire spool, a little bit of wire grid also. 
and this will be evaporation. So titanium evaporation between the freshly evaporated titanium within the positive and the chamber walls. Yeah, sorry, the, I mean the pump walls, even chamber walls, as you can say. The filament ionizes the gas molecule. So ionizes the gas molecule easily, they react with titanium atoms and they get buried at the surface of this wall. And like that, it creates the atom and it also used for 10 power minus 10 level pressure meter. Again, the pumping speed also at 10 power 4 or so selection of pump. So we have to see what is the level of vacuum we are going to work, and size of the chamber, the out gas and weight we are going to all these things, and type of vacuum port, and positioning of the pump. Of course, we cannot use the diffusion pump in uh, top to bottom direction. Like that, we have to uh, think. Then uh, next is uh, pump down time, uh, then type of gases uh, which we are going to use in the chamber, level of cleanliness, and budget. So, if you are working in the terms of atmosphere pressure 10 power minus 3 level, better you can use uh, watery pump roots from the everyone's ocean pump also. But 10 power minus 3 to minus 7 high vacuum ranges, better to use diffusion with turbo and cryo pumps. At the level of 10 power minus 10, then it is again the ion pumps are very much useful. This red color pumps you mentioned here, like the diffusion pump and turbo and pump, they use some continuously backing with a rotary pump or a mechanical pump. But Prior pump, the turn pump, they don't want continuous backing. Uh, they need only a roughing in the initial stages. So that is again a very So as we create the vacuum, it is very important. To, these are the uh, few pumps which we, I mean, which regularly people use in the lab. That's why we selected all these, all, all these pumps. Okay? And as we create the vacuum, it is very much important to measure the vacuum also accurately. So there are uh, various types of gauges available. So we have to choose the gauges uh, for our own application, what are the pressure ranges you are going to work, which a gauge give more accurate pressure uh, readings at some levels and all. So that you have to consider. Okay? So in this case, it is capacitance gauge, uh, thermocouple gauge, um, like Pilani gauge, penny gauge, like hot cathode gauge and cold cathode gauge. These things are we are going to discuss. It, okay? So pen Pilani gauge is nothing but a commonly used gauge from atmosphere pressure to power minus 3 millibar. Penny gauge is from minus 3 to minus 9 level pressure. Then capacitance gauge which gives accurate reading at 10 power minus 2 to minus 4 level pressure. In this case, most of the depositions occur. So to get a accurate pressure and without believing completely on the pending gauge, this gauge will give a better reading. So people use capacitance gauge for highly uh, I mean, precise coatings and uh, processor. Okay? So this is the uh, Pirani gauge, uh, this one, I mean, uh, so you can see uh, there will be four uh, resistors, one cluster is connected to the vacuum system. So when a wire is getting heated up, what happens? There will be uh, heat loss in the terms of conduction, convection, and radiation. But when you create the vacuum here, there won't be much gas molecules to radiate the gas, uh, I mean heat. So what happens when the vacuum, uh, when they evacuate, when we evacuate and when we create vacuum, the heat will increase. When the heat when, when the heat increases, the resistance also increases. So this is an indirect method of measuring the pressure by looking at the change in the resistance. Okay. So uh, it is again used up to 10 power minus 3 or minus 4 some level and all. Uh, but minus 4 is very rare case, minus 3 only we can say. Okay? So there is a gauge which we use for this uh, low pressure, I mean uh, low vacuum measure. Okay? Then we go to the uh, pending gauge. So here uh, there will be two with uh, one cathode and uh, anode here. So this is like there will be a high uh, voltage applied here and there will be a combined electric field and magnetic field again. Uh, so the gases get ionized. The ionized gases uh, makes ionic current that gives uh, an indirect pattern again. By seeing change in the ion current, we are seeing the pressure. So it is again by minus 3 to minus 10 level changes. Then bad Albert gauge. So here it is nothing but the uh, hot cathode ionization gauge. So here you can see there is a uh, filament. The filament emits electron. They get ion uh, they ionize the gas molecules. And uh, grid there is a grid which confines the ionized gas molecules to the center of the collector where we where the ionic current will be measured. And again, like this gauge, we cannot use continuously because if you run for a long time, the filament can break. So we have to just switch on and see the gate and I mean the pressure reading and switch off immediately. Compared to the cold cathode uh, ionization gate. This can be always on also. Then come Parsons gauge. 
it is nothing but possible diaphragm uh, changes the bow shape according to the pressure variation like you can see here and by changing the d i mean uh, uh, distance there will be capacity variation and it is again a direct method of measuring the uh, pressure uh, see in the capacitance variation and it is used in the depression systems mainly to monitor the pressures at 10 power minus 2 to minus 4 millipower ranges so now we will go to the leak uh, detection. So in a vacuum system, it is always important to have a thorough leak test always over a period of time, maybe, maybe monthly once in the So as I was telling the chemical, I mean, uh, the forces of gas to the chamber, like uh, sorption, I mean, uh, what was it? Uh, we have three terminals I was talking in the terms of uh, gas releases. One is, uh, Yeah, adsorption, diffusion, and permeation. So these things are important. This, the leak is coming, it comes under real leak. So that's going, what we are going to discuss. Okay. Okay. So we will go to test the uh, techniques. So from atmospheric pressure to temper minus 3 millibar, if it is temper or 0 or temper 1 or different, I mean, pressure. Uh, that level leak is the mean there can be a hissing sound or some kind of whistling sound will be there it is always important to note the sound and to make out where is the leak or you can use acetone you test if you pass acetone to the uh, joints uh, there is to the leak that suddenly increases the uh, pressure in the gauge you can monitor you can do that so we can measure the and uh, we can find the leak like that but below 10 power minus 3 level it is always difficult to uh, I mean, use this first two techniques, then we have to use helium uh, leak detection technique or RGA. Okay. So, why we are using helium? Helium is very light and uh, it is very, very less in the atmosphere, I mean, uh, air. So, again, it is a non destroyed technique, helium is safe gas. So, assume that this is the uh, test piece, so your cylinder is there, and if you are purging the helium gas, the vacuum uh, chamber is connected to the uh, leak uh, detection also. If a minor amount of leak is that the heat and leak goes inside, the depression happens in the uh, analog uh, display and it shows that there is a presence of leak in the chamber. So always when you do this leak test of helium, you have to do it from top to bottom because always the helium gas go to the upward direction because helium is lightweight gas. So if there is a leak in this this point and you are just testing first here, the helium of course it can go like this also and you get misleader. So to avoid that, better to use from top to bottom. And next technique is to use residual gas analyzer. But residual gas analyzer is not a technique used for uh, uh, leak detection purpose. It is used mainly for contamination in the process chamber and process monitoring. Also, it can be used for the leak detection purpose. So there are two different types of uh, uh, residual gas analyzer. It is coarse type and open type. So these two will uh, I'll be showing in the next slides in detail. And again, this is working at range of 10 power minus 4 or below, minus 4 millibar. Or below. The working principle is nothing but mass spectrometer. So, how to how we are operating the I mean RGA? There will be an ionizer. The ionizer is nothing but here there is a filament. The filament ionizes gas gas molecules, and the gas molecules are focused using the electrostatic lens. And there will be a quadrupole mass filter uh, to direct this gas uh, molecules in a particular direction. And if there will be a uh, bent area uh, to, I mean, uh, how the gas molecules and separate them based on their charge to mass ratio. So based on the mass, we can, I mean, it, it will be automatically uh, changing the position of their uh, I mean, collision in the Faraday cup. Okay. So this is like uh, Faraday cup is ion detector and mass spectrum is for the readout. So this is the inlet, then source, analyzer, ion detector, and meter. This is the output in the software. So this is the open type RGA and this is the closed type RGA. Closed type RGA is nothing but we are having an extra rotary pump, uh, rotary pump and uh, turbo pump to keep this system always in 10 power minus 4 or even below. Because RGA can work at 10 power minus 4 only. If your process is at 10 power minus 2 or even higher than that, then you have to use a differential pumping system. Uh, to protect the RGA filament uh, from breaking. So that is why it is called post-type RGA. Okay. 
then we goes to the this is the vacuum chamber and the flow state energy is contained here because it's a magnetic transporter system which work at power minus 3 or minus 2 millivolt per second so by keeping this pump on here will be at power minus 4 even minus 5 also always there will be gas flow from higher concentration to the lower concentration like that we can easily mesh in the case of eb mode operation or iron bed operation they always work at power minus 4 or even below so we can directly connect to the chamber without any uh, turbo or rotor and to calibrate the rga you can simply pass any gas here we pass argon gas so that's only the peak of argon is increased here otherwise there was no argon uh, presence in the chamber then this is the example of uh, classical uh, I mean, use of rga in the chamber like see this is the rga head and chamber at high vacuum so rga has very uh, less amount of Uh, water vapor, but when we admitted RGA by opening the valve to this chamber, so chamber, the slight increase happened, even the nitrogen also, because chamber is large volume, and when we started heating the chamber to 200 degrees, 200, 300, 500 degrees, slightly it started increasing, because there will be degassing in the chamber. Over a period of time, the degassing is over, and again the gas particles start to come down. But when we started the titanium precoupling. When, when we pass uh, sorry when we pass argon gas uh, along with argon gas there will be always increased like uh, though the argon gas is 99.99 uh, uh, percentage pure also this rga measure in the range of parts per billion so it can easily trace out the 0.001 percentage impurities also so uh, when we pass argon gas to chamber naturally the uh, other gases like carbon dioxide hydrogen helium also hydrogen and the water vapor also is increased but when we started hydrogen precipitation Suddenly, the water vapor came down, and the hydrogen level is increased. And over a period of time, the temperature spectrum is started decreasing. So, which indicates almost all the, I mean, most of the uh, water vapor is, I mean, uh, pumped out or buried using titanium battery. So, the reaction, chemical reaction happened is nothing but titanium reacts with uh, water vapor, I mean, moisture, and it forms titanium oxide (TuOx) plus H2. That H2 is again released to the chamber. That's why hydrogen level is increased here. Then it is decreased. So this is the ideal condition. You need to start your process. Otherwise, uh, there will be some impurities in the filling or in the other process also. And again, the RGA had we can have use as a RGA portion only. We can measure first and connect with the process chamber to see the difference in the level of uh, I mean the gas molecules. Then we also we can use this RGA for this uh, calibrating the flow flow rates of mass flow controllers. So here you can see the two uh, the mass flow has varied of nitrogen from two on two SCM to five SCM based on the partial pressure of nitrogen. Also you can see here it is increasing linearly. So this one so can be studied using the RGA. So RGA has different types of spectrum. We can uh, have ones I mean uh, by excess uh, pressure and uh, excess is uh, in the atomic mass unit. And again, you can see pressure versus time span. So over a period of time, how the gas molecules are behaving. Or also, you can see here with RGA. Uh, then this is the again like different gases level on this one. And these are the atomic mass unit of different gases, which you have to see and uh, compare in the standard library to see what are the gases present in the uh, spectrum. Okay. Then, uh, what is the difference between residual gas analyzer and helium detection? That will be always a question. So it is always better to compare these two. But you can see if there is a leak in the chamber, nothing but air is leaking into the chamber. Uh, so you can see increase of nitrogen and oxygen because they are the dominating gases. So if uh, nitrogen and oxygen is more in the vacuum chamber than mainly uh, I mean moisture, then we can say there is a leak in the system by using RGA. But to find the leak in RGA, you can use uh, we can convert the RGA. I mean we can. Uh, deactivate all other gases present in the I mean, library, and we can activate only helium, and we can trace it. And there is no need of helium also. We can use any gas, even argon also. We can use by selecting only argon in the mass spectrum, RGA mass spectrum. Okay. And the material is used in the vacuum. It is nothing but styrene steel, uh, mainly SS three zero three zero four three zero six three one six also mainly used. They are easy to machine, easy to fusion well also. Then they use there is use of copper. OFHC, nothing but oxygen-free, highly conductivity copper for electrical conductors, and high alumina for electrical insulators in vacuum, and power and glass metal seals like that. And good vacuum practice includes arresting all the leaks all the way, and the use of molecular seals and trap to trap the oil vapors, and uh, metal to non-porous ceramic oil piece. Then 
plastic grease used very less avoid touching with bare hands use uh, cf plunges or kf for better sealing uh, then uh, break out the chamber to reduce out gas and degas inhalation and again good local conductors which i was talking in the beginning is important for the then gas composition rg is very nice to have always then again important points to be noticed in the vacuum systems is real leak virtual leaks and water leak and oil contamination fingerprints organic materials that are gas mainly the vacuum chamber so these things we have to be keeping in mind uh, the next is like application uh, mechanical handling and like uh, there are the lot of interest of like the like EB modification proteins then uh, in the surface science uh, epitaxial growth and uh, storage rings and uh, pure, uh, pure growth there are a lot of applications for vacuum and of course there is a lot of uh, danger parts in the vacuum also electrical hazard is very much important the electrical field tools you have to be uh, periodically testing if it is giving any kind of uh, shorting then it will become get shot then Chilled water safety. The chilled water should not uh, overcool and contents on the surface. And if it falls on any electrical circuits, and it will damage your electrical components. And gas safety, viewport safety. Viewport should have proper thickness. Or if there is a chance of breaking the viewport, it can harm a person also. Hot surfaces. Then high noise level. And people who sit in the lab continuously, they can have issues with hearing problem. And uh, unguarded rotating parts. And high pressure. Hot exhaust areas to be carefully addressed. With. In magnetic field, RF leaks and all has to be protected because these things can cause serious health issues in lab. Okay, thank you. I hope I finish in time. Salish. Perfect timing, Jitin. Thank you. You can ask. Thank you for the insightful yes. talk about various vacuum. For various vacuum techniques thank you for the wonderful talk and you know thank your you. talk was really enlightening and i would suggest that participants would have uh, learned a lot from your presentation and now i would like to ask participants to introduce themselves and then ask the questions So, Jitin, one question from my side. Uh, you know, okay. you, you said about that RGA, residual gas analyzers. So, is this RGA, is it able to detect almost each and every gas or it only is yeah, specific yeah. to certain gas? It's like uh, the atomic mass unit ranges from uh, 1 to 200 IMU. So, in that range, any gas is false, we can measure that. So whatever the gas, I mean, whatever the RGS we are in lab, it is 1 to 200 IMU. You can measure it. Mm -hmm. Almost all the things will come under between 1 to 65 IMU. Most of the gases which we are using regularly. So, okay. okay. Now, uh, any other question from anybody, any part? Please unmute yourself. Can you please ask questions? Yeah, this is Lakshmi Narayana from RCI. Uh, good afternoon. Good evening to all. Yeah, fine. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I must thank you for the wonderful presentation uh, covering the, all the uh, vacuum techniques and pumps. My question is, uh, like you uh, explained about the cryo pump. Uh, so, did yes. you see uh, any uh, uh, hide the water vapor content uh, study have done uh, in the chamber yeah, when uh, the cryo uh, pump is uh, yes, what happened is we have cryo pump and turbo of the lab, and we have two vacuum chambers that are having similar uh, volume. Okay, okay, and they are kept in the same laboratory. So, we used the uh, RGA to study the uh, moisture level in uh, a cryo pump system and a turbo pump system. So, we found that cryo pump is giving much more better uh, I mean, uh, water vapor. Uh, I mean, lower, water, low, low, lower, lower levels. Uh, okay. So that's why, like, like that's why we prepared our uh, ambient system which we use for so oxide coating because oxide coatings are very much uh, getting affected by water level. So, mm. so that's why we choose uh, um, cryo pump power for that purpose. Okay. 
means uh, under identical conditions of like a degassing uh, for example if chamber is degassed uh, up to that is 100 degrees centigrade still you yeah. see the uh, the water content uh, with the turbo pumping dominant dominant yeah, it will be, yeah. do, do, be mainly dominant the water vapor only in the turbo pump case okay, okay. but in the cryo pump it will be like less but cryo pump issue is that if you do this uh, i mean uh, degassing for i mean heating the chamber for longer duration this heat can be uh, i mean transferred to the cryo pump cold head also and there can be a slight increase in the cryo temperature it can be increased from 15 kelvin to 20 kelvin to 25 kelvin again so that can reduce the pumping speed again so that has to be carefully addressed okay for longer heating okay you got it you got it you got it and did you use the iron pumps in your system sir no i don't ever use it so we use only cryo pump and uh, social pumps okay okay iron pump mainly we see in the scm xps or such stuff and high dry air in your present somewhere you Yeah, so you so like in, yeah, iron pumps we show because it is a different types of pumps I was talking about. So I just told that. I have a little uh, doubt on the like uh, values you have mentioned 10 power 4 liter per second eh, for the yeah. iron pump. I mean, speed. That must be speed. That must be speed. Is it speed. possible with iron pumps? Yeah, that is mainly the question about in terms of the CM column or electron dark column side of it. So the, the, they they won't be much higher uh, volume areas. Right? I mean volume occupied. Uh, so that the, even if you see this cryo pump also, mm -hmm. if you see this it is five thousand uh, like liter per second right, for this water vapor. Water vapor, yes. Yeah, so it is it's nearly five liter per three. It can be the cryo pump itself. Mm -hmm. So it can be possible. Right? Because uh, uh, we are using we are using actually the iron pump. But okay. the speed is limited to let us say with a forty mm uh, flange size, um, around hundred hundred liter per second limited. Um, okay. Maybe that is made for nitrogen. Okay. But ten power four is a huge uh, pumping speed. Huge, yeah, may not probably. be possible with. Yeah. Uh, variant maybe make. Like, variant uh, make. Uh, yeah. Maybe uh, like what about that admission? I mean the uh, that inlet port also may be a uh, maybe it's slightly. Yeah, higher dimension is if you see our cryo pump uh, the moment we open the gate wall it goes to from at I mean, uh, power minus 2 to power minus 6 so in some one minute time one minute or two minutes maximum mm -hmm. so entrapment type pumps are that much capable of uh, taking the load can okay, you anyway, i'll check it in the the back to you Okay, okay. So you are using it with your uh, and beam system that uh, cryo pump only, that uh, ultrawide system. Is it cryo pump or turbo? No, the big bigger chambers always we will go. We should go for a cryo pump and a combination of a turbo. Okay. But where is a very smaller volume? I think it is better to go for a iron pump okay. for smaller volumes okay. because the, I I think uh, pumping speed is a limitation with the uh, iron pumps. Mm -hmm. Okay, right. So, yeah, reporting I chambers only. I think I have seen, but in our case, uh, because our application is a very small, small volume, but we need a very ultra high vacuum. So we use a combination of uh, turbo plus uh, iron pump. So yeah, I have checked that one. How many students are using that? Yeah. Yeah, I think I'm done. I'm done. My question. Yeah. Thank you, Lakshmanan ji. Uh, any any other participant? Any questions? Good evening, sir. Uh, sir, I have a question. Uh, sir, can we use the backing pump and the vacuum booster together to increase the efficiency and the output? Can we use the rotary pump? Uh, so backing pump and the vacuum booster together can be considered together to increase the efficiency and the output. Uh, what is the level of vacuum you are working? Uh, so let's say if I'm working, so it's ultra high volume, sir. 
No, back, backing pump means, uh, I mean, you'll be using the rotary pump, right? Backing pump, mainly. So they go up to number minus 2 millibar or minus 3 millibar. And if you use a... Which one should you use? What is the ultra high volume? You know? I use ultra high vacuum. What is the level of uh, pressure? I mean, require minus two or minus three or minus nine. Hello? Hello? Yeah, any other question from anybody else in the uh, participants? Is everything clear to you? Or you have uh, Jitin, uh, uh, sorry, actually, I joined uh, from in the, in the middle of the presentation. But, but Did you cover the topics like the uh, vacuum calculations uh, for a... Uh, no, no, I didn't cover that because really, uh, no, I didn't cover that. That problem I didn't cover because it is a lengthy age, right? So I have to finish in one hour, one hour also. So this, this is a okay, nearly okay, maybe, maybe, yeah. Okay. yeah. If, some, if any expert is available, uh, who can cover that yeah. uh, vacuum calculations? Yeah, yeah, we can do that. I, I have done that once with the uh, industry department. We can do it. Okay. And this leak leak detection, whatever the yeah. our helium uh, MSLD lead detector that gives, uh, let us okay. say, ultra high, ultra low leak, a temper of minus seven or minus nine uh, millibar liter per second. So, uh, is there any conversion for this uh, machine leak rate that what it displays to the uh, general leak rate? What we do like uh, for a pressure system and the pressure drop per time. So, uh, is there any uh, calculation available to correlate uh, the leak rates? So that is like a rate of rise. You can say if you stop the pump suddenly. Assume that your chamber is under minus 9 millibar pressure and suddenly you stop pumping, the pressure starts increasing, right? Slowly, you can go minus 8, minus 7, level, like that it is increasing. Right? I so think there is a net network issue, I think I could not uh, hear you fully. Can you hear me? Hello? Hello? Did, did, you, did you get my question, sir? Jitin? Yeah, I, yeah, I got it, I got it. I got it. So what happened is? Yeah, my, uh, my, question, you, my question is, uh, oh. my, my question is, uh, the leak detector displays uh, directly the millibar liter per second. Uh, that, uh, how to correlate that rate with a, uh, a manual measurement of uh, uh, drop, uh, pressure drop uh, uh, leak rate? Yeah. So, so, so much delta P. Uh, yeah, that is like, uh, we, are talking, we talk in terms of rate of rise. When we suddenly stop the pumping, how the uh, I mean gas I mean the gas levels are increasing. I mean from 10 power minus 9, how much time it takes to reach 10 power minus 3, all those things. That is called rate of rise. So that we do calculation with RGA. What are the gases increasing suddenly in the chamber when we stop pumping? Okay. So that is again a different uh, I mean topic. I I, I didn't show, share that side here because it is a different topic actually. So that is called rate of rise. Yeah, rate of rise. Can, can, can you correlate uh, uh, rate of rise also can be uh, thought as a leak, leak rate. Let us say there is a leak yes, uh, yeah. Yeah. to which there is a rise in the pressure, assuming uh, the outgassing and uh, effects uh, for uh, time being. Oh. Okay. And how to uh, correlate this value to the uh, the machine displayed uh, uh, leak rate? Yeah. So that we cannot say because leak rate pressure we can see only helium, right? Only helium. We are seeing only helium gas. Mm. Yeah. See, in, in, if it is, is not that, RGA. Is that again the pressure rise per unit volume or for a given volume? Oh, that's actually I need some calculation. Yeah, that calculation I don't have right now with me. I want mean, to see that. There is a calculation for that. I know that. So that is like, uh, see, in, in the case of leak system with uh, leak, uh, helium leak system, we cannot do that because it is only showing the rise of helium gas. But it is not actually rise of helium, it's all gas are present. So we have to use RGA for that purpose to see that level of increase. What are the gases increasing? How much level they are increasing? Even to be that. That calculation we have to do. So there is a formula for that. I think I can share you that. There are different slides for that. Okay. Okay, Jitendu. Yeah. 
Any other question from the participants? You can also put your question into the chat box. Okay. Today we really, really apologize for the, you know, uh, internet connectivity. It wasn't good really for, for some reason. So that's why, you know, some of the points might have missed out while speaking. Uh, anyway, it was a good uh, delivery by uh, Mr. Jitin. And uh, now we, we, you know, before closing the session, I would like to uh, tell about the next presentation. Next talk to expert program would be by Dr. William Surin. Uh, he is the principal research scientist in Center for Infectious Disease Research Building, Department of Microbiology and Cell Biology, at ISC Bangalore. And he'll be talking about flow cytometry same day next week 3:30 pm so i would request everybody to join uh, and also propagate this message to the concerned people working in flow cytometry and today we we would like to wrap up the session thank you jitin yeah thank you sir thank you for giving this opportunity thank you all the